Right. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start the session 7A on grid projects. It's about projects which are done in Europe and which are uh, basically funded partially by national governments in Europe or by the European Commission. The order of the talks has been changed, as you could see in the online version of the program, and we start with the Unicor presentation, then followed by the Meteor Grid, and then the GRIP, and then finally the Computational Physics of Natural Phenomena Project. I would like to have the first speaker then, Mr. Hoppe from Palace to talk about Unicor. Mr. Hoppe, please. Okay, thanks. So it's my pleasure to present you um, the work done in the Unicor Plus project. Okay, now let's try to... Okay, this is about the Unicor grid system. Well, it's a system for seamless access to diverse resources, and I'll give you an overview of the objectives of our approach and of the status that the software has. Um, let me add right at the beginning that you can watch a demo of the Unicor system at the booth um, of Forschungszentrum Jülich, which is at the right-hand side of the lobby here. Okay, brief outline. Well, the approach, architecture, and implementation. There are a number of research and application projects currently going on. I give you a very brief overview about those because you get more information on two of the more important ones later on. And then a slide on availability of the software sources, objects, and the outlook. So let's <coughs> look at the approach. Well, at the beginning of Unico, and that is about, well, about five years ago when we really started the project that led to the software in the state that it currently is. Uh, the main objective was to provide end users of scientific applications a uniform work domain. Well, target community would include physicists, would include chemists, would include astronomers uh, that run a couple of um, simulation applications on parallel computers in their work day with varying uh, data resources, maybe do pre- and post-processing. And we wanted to help them to access diverse resources and to unify things like the access and authorization mechanisms that they need to um, cope with in order to access different centers. We want to help them to, uh, <clears throat> to use different platforms without knowing exactly how to drive the batch systems and the compilers and the linkers on the different systems. And we wanted to give them a nice way to express workflows and complicated jobs so that they don't need to write NQS job scripts uh, but do it at a lower level than necessary. The intended Unicor users, as I said, well, we're end users. We are explicitly not targeting developers. Uh, well, this is uh, pretty apparent. Unicor is, has um, its most strongest points in batch-like processing. Interactive processing is not the thing uh, that actually fits into the concept. And um, well, while we're working in several projects to allow job steering and to allow some interactive control about applications, uh, Unico will still be a poor fit for general shell type, interactive shell type uh, use in applications. Um, so what have we done or what were the objectives? Um, well, right at the beginning we stated that we want to give users seamless access. And basically what the software provides now is the access, and that is the, well, way of connecting to Unicor resources is the same for all the participating centers. We do have a job model that is completely independent of where the job is actually being executed. It's a task graph model. I have a couple of slides on, the, on those later on. We also have a resource model similar to what Globus provides so that there's an abstract set of descriptions for each participating platform, for each participating resource. And they're also seamless. There are no differences in the abstract model between sites. And finally, uh, the way that users can look at their jobs, do job monitoring and control their execution works the same across all the centers. We do have security mechanisms. Uh, 
well, when we started, it was pretty clear that uh, password-based security, uh, transmission of passwords across unsecure networks is not a good way to protect resources. Um, so we, from the beginning, uh, based our work on X509 certificate-based authentication. We do it a little bit different than Globus, than Globus does, and there will be more information uh, about that uh, in the talk by Dietmar Alvin about the GRIP project. Um, another decision we reached very early on was to let the participating sites do authorization, do checking of quotas, well, do pricing and accounting of what was go well, of the computation cycles. So this is not handled by the systems but by the participating centers so that they can actually have their freedom to use whatever mechanisms they, uh, they choose and whatever mechanisms uh, are integrated into their work environment. Um, finally, while we protect data integrity and confidentiality, uh, because we rely on SSL, we can also rely on HTTPS and an extension. We're working on uh, one of the projects to include stronger uh, cryptographic, uh, stronger cryptography, but even with the normal Unicode software, data is protected well, to quite a good extent. Um, <clears throat> early on in the project, well, when we started in 97, uh, we looked at portable implementation techniques. Basically, uh, the decision uh, that we took at that time has proven to be correct. We had some hard time at the beginning because we relied on the Java platform for all components except one script-like component that runs on the supercomputers. Um, finally, well, with Java 1.3 and Java 1.4, it is stable enough and it's performant enough to actually work well enough. So Java is the implementation platform, and Java is also the platform or the method to define objects and the method to define the protocols being used between the client and server components. Uh, so that was a nice property that we could use the same language. Um, we've adapted since to use XML for job stores and also for some of the other modelization. Um, this process basically continues. Um, system integration. Well, a very important uh, objective for us was to run on centers that uh, are actually very security conscious. Well, like the European uh, Center for uh, Medium Range Weather Forecast, like other centers that don't let users in just based on password authentication alone, that have pretty strict firewall rules. And uh, the Unicor software well, stands, stands out against Globus in that we can actually cooperate even with pretty strict firewall and security architectures. Uh, and, uh, well, the other very important point here was to give the sites enough autonomy to preserve, well, whatever their work processes, processes and whatever their system setup was. Extensibility, um, one strong point, but it's a little known point of Unico is that, well, we have published, or the definitions of the protocols are available, the protocols themselves are extensible, and the standard client actually is, ext is easily extensible by adding new, f new panels, uh, new functions to do it to the GUI. And there are actually some interesting application-specific plugins uh, that are available right now, and you can see that at the uh, Unicode demo. So what's the Unicode resource model? And I guess this is the, this is the laser pointer, yeah. Um, <clears throat> at the top level, a Unico grid consists of a number of Unico sites. Well, we do have our own jargon, so we call a Unico site a U site. So these are two U sites, one at Jülich, one at Munich. Those U sites <coughs> have a component that we call the Unico gateway, and I have an architecture slide next, which is the single point of entry. <coughs> and each Unico site um, advertises a number of systems, which we call virtual sites or we sites, to the outside world. So Ulich, for instance, has um, a Linux cluster called Zampano. There's a T90, there are two T3Es, and they are modeled as virtual sites. <coughs> and a virtual site can easily be a single system, it can also be a cluster of systems where you, can't, where you can't actually find out where things are executed, or it could be uh, a capability cl uh, capacity cluster of origins, for instance. So we have this two-level hierarchy here. Uh, for each we site, like for instance for this T3E, uh, we have a set of resources, available resources, that users can actually, that Unico users can actually access. And there are things like, well, number of processors, CPU time, memory, permanent disk space, 
which we call capacity resources. There are also things like which MPI version is running, which CPMD version. This is uh, a, molecular, a molecular dynamics application code is running, which we call a capability resources. So we can model with the resources the set of available services, the set of available computing services, data services for the users. And this is attached to the to the, uh, this is attached to the Wii sites and is advertised to the outside world. So a user can query, well, can look at the user site, select Wii sites and query, well, what can I do on this system? What can I do on the other system? Um, that's the resource model. The job model, <clears throat> well, it's pretty simple. Well, but basically, uh, every job model works in a similar way. Well, we do have um, a directed a cyclic graph of tasks. A task can be a compilation, it can be an execution of a command, it can be a script, it can be an import or export of a data set from permanent disk space into the execution disk space. Uh, it can be a control task. So we have this task graph here. Actually, a typical example would be first you import some uh, well, model data from the outside, this can actually be your workstation you're sitting on, or this can be some other permanent disk space. You then execute an application, while well, this one is a, local, uh, uh, a localized meteor meteorological forecast. Well, after this has been executed, you test for success. Well, if this stuff didn't work, and there are many reasons why uh, such an application may actually terminate with an error, well, you would notify the user. Otherwise, you would transfer the data to another, to another use site and then post-process it. Now, you could, can assume that this system here has some graphic software that's not available here, so you post-process post -process it, and at the, the end of your, your job, you can export the data again to a file space where it will survive, well, basically forever. That is a typical or that's a possible job. What you can see here is that uh, we can have uh, hierarchical jobs, so we can have a job that runs on one system and then has a part that has to run on another system. And things like uh, data transfer are handled by Unicore. Also things like transfer of control and uh, scheduling of jobs are handled accordingly. Uh, right now, with the current state of the software, the user has to target the execution system. So the user has to uh, tell the system, run this one here on this Wii side, run the other one on this particular Wii side. But within one of the projects, within Eurogrid, there's a resource broker component being developed so that actually the system can decide for the user where to run things based on availability of resources. The Unicore architecture, uh, well, we do assume that clients are connected to the internet from somewhere. Uh, our Unicore client software, as it is Java-based, uh, runs on PCs, it runs on Macs, it runs on Linux and other Unix boxes. It does not run on PDAs yet, um, but we do cover uh, the whole spectrum of workstations that are in use in our field right now. And the user connects from, well, anywhere on the insecure internet. And while well, we do use SSL, uh, an SSL connection, we do use SSL protocol here, well, to not be easily intercepted or spoofed. Uh, we do have at each use site a single point of entry which we call a gateway. This one acts as an SSL server, so it, it, uh, it uh, accepts incoming SSL connections from clients. Uh, we use certificates to actually authenticate the software components here. So we have uh, a quite good degree of security uh, at that point here. The gateway, well, simply authenticates a Unico user by looking at the Unico user certificate and if a valid Unico user has actually, well, sent a request or initiated the, the transmission, then well, the transmi transmission is tunneled through to the main server component, which for historical reasons, and we have a lot of jargon, is called the Network Jobs, Job Supervisor, or NJS. Actually, you do have one of those servers for each we site running. And the Network Job Supervisor, well, receives requests and jobs, deconstructs them, schedules job, job components and controls the execution. So it's basically the heart of the Unicore system. The Network Job Supervisor, well, it uses a component called a Target System Interface, or TSI, to actually connect to uh, an underlying uh, batch subsystem, batch execution system, which could be, for instance, NQE or NQS. It can also be PBS Pro. It can be load leveler. We're working on an LSF port. 
So that's the architecture here. We do have, uh, well, for each Unico installation, there are a number of databases. One is the incarnation database, and one is the user database. The user database contains the mapping between the identity of Joe user as a Unico user and the local Unix login that he or she is allowed to use. And the incarnation database actually contains the concrete and the system-specific commands to move data, to do compilation, well, to start a batch job, all these kind of things. So uh, the client component, the gateway, and the NJS are written in Java. Only the TSI, which on many installations has to run on uh, an HPC platform like a T3E or Fujitsu system, is written in Perl right now. It could also be written in any other, in any other language, but Perl was the but, well, method of uh, choice in the project. The, the security model, I uh, already mentioned that we do authentication based on Unico user certificates. So given that you have a working public key infrastructure and you can protect the integrity of uh, the certification authority, uh, well, this rules out access by any non uh, well, by any non-Unico user, by any user that doesn't have a good standing within your Unico grid. Uh, but in addition to just keeping the bad guys out, what we do is we also pass part of, parts of the permanent user certificates uh, as part of the job down to the server component, and we do sign the job definition by the user's private key so that the servers can actually check whether along the transmission path, somebody has actually altered the job description and put in something that does not belong there, like, for instance, an RM minus RF into a script that wasn't there, so that the server, the NJS server that at the end of the chain actually has to execute something can check that this was actually put into, and put into the job and defined by this Unico user. Um, by using this kind of, uh, <coughs> by using this kind of, uh, of procedure, well, we actually um, avoid the need for transitive trust between the Unico sides. Otherwise, if you have a job that uh, is submitted, for instance, to a site at Jülich and then has a part that's going to run in Munich, the guys at Munich would need to trust Jülich that, well, the NJS and the various server components are running uncompromised. This is not necessary, just because each job component is being signed by the user's private key. And that's the main difference of our security scheme compared with Globus. Well, we also have some smaller differences. Well, one thing is that we are not using, uh, we're not using temporary certificates. We're relying, on, um, we're relying on permanent certificates and Unico, while well, the Unico project and all the other projects around Unico actually have their own PKIs established. They use various rules, but the one with the Unico Plus project uses very strict rules so that we can actually show that it is possible to run the grid using, well, permanent certificates and real-life PKI rules. The technology, I already mentioned most of the points here. <coughs> uh, just want to stress, stress again the point that we can coex uh, coexist with, well, all the usual firewall architectures and that means we can run outside the exterior firewall, we can run inside the interior firewall if you want to tunnel through SSL requests to a certain port, or we can run in the DMZ. And the gateway is a pretty small component. It has been available at, in source since quite a long time. All the other things are now available at source code. So we actually managed to get the, uh, to get the gateway installed in sites that are really secure, security conscious and are really alert against opening holes uh, uh, <clears throat> to the outside. Um, one interesting point, but uh, while it's interesting from a theoretical point of view, is the job model that we have. It's the, we call it the abstract job model. It's currently done in Java, and it's a pretty complex Java object structure, but it's part of uh, well, our investigation to go towards uh, or to check whether we can be OXA compliant. Well, we actually did some experiments to model this and to model the client-server protocol in a WSDL and OXA compliant terms, and it uh, turns out that this is possible. Uh, so 
uh, it seems that the transition from our homebrew protocol to an OXA compliant on WSDL and SOAP based protocol is actually possible without too much pain, which shows that the theoretical or the, that the uh, theoretical object structure well, was, chosen, well, was chosen well enough at the time. So the Unicode look and feel, the client that, uh, that I had mentioned is a graphical client. Uh, it shows you the job tree. It shows you status of jobs. It lets you edit the various uh, tasks using uh, panels, using dialog panels. You can see it in the Ulich booth outside in the lobby. And, well, that's, it's a real-life demo. So things are actually running at DWD or at Ulich or at LRZ Munich. Uh, you can create and submit jobs and see what they're doing. Um, one very important point is the extensibility. And here, uh, well, the most interesting progress has been made with what we call application frontends or application plugins. Well, I'd mentioned the job model. This is a very generic model. You could do any kind of task. You could include any kind of tasks in a Unico job. Uh, but our target, end user, our target end users usually use a couple of very important applications. Well, if you have engineering end users, they will use something like Nastran or, or Mark or Star CD or whatever. If you have scientific end users, depending on uh, the user domain, you will also have some standard applications. And so the idea uh, was pretty straightforward to build in support for the important standard applications so that people, well, have a more comfortable way to actually put in input parameters. The application front end can do some checking between in input parameters to see that they make sense, that there was no error, to, that there was no error made. Uh, and this kind of support has been realized by, well, two measures. One is to uh, open up the client interface by a plugin interface so that it is very easy for well, Java programmers to write their own panels and also to use the facilities of the client to actually submit jobs and control jobs. The other thing is that for each of these standard applications, well, people are writing plugins that then can be loaded into the client. And there's one, one very interesting example uh, for the CPMD, that's the Caparinello, Caparinello Molecular Dynamics Code, which shows that the power of this plugin concept, while well, uh, the uh, CPMD application used to have about 500 different input parameters, many of them interdependent, and uh, in the conventional usage mode, a user would use a text editor to create this file, and we need a couple of weeks to be familiar enough with the application to not make too many errors. And with the application front end, there are dialogues now, dialog boxes, and all the various uh, dependencies of input parameters are now checked against each other. And this kind of, uh, well, application front end and of plugin implementation is clearly, well, a key feature to getting those end users that we want to, because they are not per se interested in using grid software. Well, they are interested in getting something that makes their workday easier and that allows them to do more, uh, more runs uh, in a day or more runs in a week. The Unico projects, most of the work I've uh, well told you about has been done in a German research project called Unico Plus. There are two other projects, two other bigger projects running now. There's Eurogrid, and you will hear some of the work done in Eurogrid presented by uh, Dr. Lenz, which uh, is, I guess, the next talk. And there's the project GRIP, which is, well, about in making Unico and Globus, which, well, the two, of, the two systems have been uh, developed independently, uh, make them interoperate so that you can submit jobs from one system into the other and could couple the resources so that you get a, a larger resource pool. And there will be more information on that by the talk by Dietmar Irwin. And, well, well, we're working with some other Framework 5 projects, IST Framework 5 projects, to, up, to apply the technology. And while what's going on, uh, most of you will be familiar with it. For Framework 6, there's now well, the definition phase and uh, well, the preparation phase for the new calls. And we're actively with our partners in the Unico project uh, looking for applications in Framework 6. Availability and outlook. Right now, we are at uh, version th uh, 3.6. Well, it has been available for project partners and also for people outside the project on request, email, or whatever to one of the partners. But since a couple of days, and I checked it yesterday, well, you can actually ex get access to the sources via a download mechanism, and I have a URL on the next slide. 
So we're now an open source project. Basically, anybody can get the sources and you can do what you want with them. Uh, well, the only thing forbidden is to use them for commercial purposes or in production. So any research use is covered by the license that you accept when you download the, uh, the sources. Well, there's an upcoming production version, and well, that's version 4.0. We call it a production version because it will be used in production at some of the centers, and it will be solid enough to be used in production. Up to now, we are basically in the same mode as Globus, that we well, have put in interesting features and done some optimizations, but now the emphasis is on making this thing actually usable for a computing center and, well, making it robust enough. And this is version 4.0, and we expect the release to be in the July-August time frame. And again, well, the source repository will be updated once the stuff is stable enough, so people from the outside can get it, can look at it, and, well, comment on it or maybe improve it. And the results from the other projects, it's planned to make them available in a similar way, but, well, the other uh, presentations will contain more details about this. Finally, well, further information. Well, we do have some leaflets that are available at the Jülich booth. There are also a number of, uh, of URLs that are helpful for the various projects and for what we call the Unico Forum, which is an association of people interested in this technology. And basically, the source, well, the uh, definitions, the interfaces all belong to the Unico Forum and not to the project partners, so that there's an independent body that actually keeps, keeps track of and maintains specifications, interfaces, and documentation. There's a test grid that you can access if you want to try out a living Unico grid, so submit some jobs into it, see how it feels, how it works. And finally, there are the sources, and the URL now is real live and is working, so you can look at the sources. Well, that's it. Thank you for your... Okay, any questions? Well, I think it might be sensible to have the questions at the end of the first three talks, because they're all related in a sense to Unicore, and then have the last talk with its questions at the end. So maybe have the second talk now on Eurogrid. Mr. Lenz. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hoffman, for the introduction. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the title of my presentation is Meteor Grid Worldwide Local Weather Forecasts by Grid Computing, and it's a collaboration of me and uh, Detlef Majewski. We are both working at the Deutsche Wetterdienst, the DWD, it's a German weather service. The contents uh, of my talk is first an introduction to uh, Eurogrid and Meteogrid. Secondly, a detailed description of Meteogrid about uh, the computational requirements, the milestones of the subproject Meteogrid, the status of work, and at the end, a typical demonstration example. The acronym Eurogrid. Uh, it represents the, the full project title, Application Testbed for European Grid Computing. It's a uh, project uh, funded by the European Commission by about 2 million of euro. The volume uh, is about 33 person years and the funding time lasts from November 2000 until October next year. Most of the following transparencies concerning the whole Eurogrid project have been supplied by Palace Limited. The vision of the Eurogrid project is to build a European grid infrastructure that gives users a seamless and secure access to high performance computing resources and that advances computational science in Europe. To approach this goal, uh, this uh, vision, uh, four main goals have been formulated. The first one is the integration of resources of leading European high-performance computer centers into a European HPC grid. Secondly, uh, the development of new software components for grid computing. Third, 
the demonstration of the application service provider model for HPC uh, access for different applications. It's similar to uh, providing an HPC portal. And last, the contribu contribution to the international grid development. The work within the Eurogrid project can be divided into four parts. The first part uh, are the application grid projects. In all of these three uh, sub-projects, uh, application-specific interfaces will be developed and uh, some grid solutions will be uh, elaborated for the, for, for the special, uh, special task in the, uh, in the grid project. It's in the biogrid project. Uh, the solution uh, is made for biochemical mechanisms in meteor grid I will uh, speak a bit later about and in CAE grid the main task of the uh, project is uh, the uh, providing an HPC portal for engineers from Daimler Chrysler and uh, for uh, aircraft simulations. The second part of the work, uh, of the work in Eurogrid is the HPC grid infrastructure. Within this part, the HPC centers uh, will be connected using the Unicore technology, and further, the Unicore technology will be operated and supported. The third part is a, is a further development and integration of new software components and embedding them into the Unicore technology. And last but not least, the dissemination and exploitation of the project goals and project results. Here it can be seen again the main tasks are from the BioGrid and CIE Grid uh, sub project. In this HPC research grid, it's the main task the operation and demonstration of the grid, but in addition, some uh, theoretical work. Uh, for example, the agreement on some security standards, uh, cert the certification, and so on. All these sub-projects formulate requirements which are used by the Unicore developers for a further development of the Unicore technology, <laughs> especially with respect to efficient data transfer, to resource brokerage, to ASP services, to application coupling, and to interactive access. The Eurogrid partners are the HPC centers in Mano in Switzerland, in Jülich, at the University of Warsaw, in CNRS Idris in Paris, the universities in Bergen and in Manchester. Only users are the Deutsche Wetterdienst, EADS and uh, T-Systems. And the project coordination will be done by Palace Limited and by FETSIT. Now coming to MeteorGrid. The goal of MeteorGrid is to provide high resolution short range weather forecasts with a relocatable non hydrostatic local model of DWD for any desired region in the world. The local model it's a local model, it's a regional uh, routine weather forecast model of a DWD and it's in operational use at DWD since about two and a half years. And meanwhile, the, lo uh, the local model is distributed to other uh, weather services in Switzerland, in Italy, in Greece and in Poland. To approach uh, this uh, meteor grid goal, uh, uh, first, the development of a relocatable version of the prediction model will be done, and then uh, weather prediction on demand as an AS ASP solution uh, will be done at the end. In principle, uh, the work within MeteorGrid can be shown with this uh, picture. The user uh, provides some input data via portal to the internet, where it's uh, transferred via the Unicore software to a supercomputer and to DWD. DWD provides, depending from this input data, topography input data and, uh, and initialization and boundary data from the global model of DWD. 
This data will be sent to the supercomputer where the main task of MeteorGrid, the calculation of the weather forecast with the local model, will be done. Finally, the results of the local model will be transferred via Unicore back to the computer of the user. Potential users of MeteorGrid uh, can be other meteorological services and some weather service providers and, of course, some individuals via Internet or, in the future, via mobile telephones. What's special about MeteorGrid? Weather forecast. Real-time weather forecasting is a time-critical task. This means a 48-hour forecast must be completed in less than 60 minutes. The code of the local model uh, is about 100,000 lines long. It's written in Fortran 95, and MPI for message passing is used. Weather forecasting is computationally expensive. Per grid point and per time step, about 4,000 4, flops are necessary. For a 48-hour forecast, for a rather small model area, uh, about 15 teraflops uh, have, uh, must be used. This means uh, in wall clock time for this uh, model calculation of about 3,000 seconds at a sustained speed of 5 gigaflops per second. Weather forecasting requires high bandwidth for data transfer. In our case, the forecast data from 48-hour for, uh, forecast will about one gigabyte, and this transfer has to be done in less than one hour. And last, weather has a so large social and economic impact worldwide, as can be seen, for example, here in this images from uh, storm damages in uh, Christmas in 99 in southern Germany and France, or some flood as here at the Vistula River in last summer, some coastal storms as uh, with the um, following flood in Hamburg or at the North Sea, as can be seen here, or some snowstorms as is blizzard in New York. The milestones, the main tasks of the MeteorGrid project is first the selection of the model domain, of the grid resolution, of the forecast date, of the forecast range, and of course of the forecast products by the user. Uh, and it's thought that the user can select these data using a graphical user interface. A first draft of this uh, graphical user interface has been uh, made by the uh, uh, project collaborators at CSCS in Mano. This, for example, is the first part of this uh, GUI draft. It's a GUI for, for the forecast date and the forecast time. The selection of the model area is intended to be done graphically as here in this draft. The second task in the MeteorGrid project is the derivation of the topographical data the input data for the local model. This has to be done from a high-resolution uh, data set which is stored at DWD. The program package uh, for these uh, topographical calculations is ready now. Here is an example, it's an orographical high of New Guinea, the soil type for the same region and uh, some vegetational data set as the leaf area index. The third task of MeteorGrid is the derivation of an initial data set and of lateral boundary data sets for the LM from a foregoing run of the global model of DWD, the global model GME. And this uh, task consists of two steps. First, uh, the GME data have to be extracted from, from an Oracle database. And in the second step, these uh, data we, uh, from on the GME grid have to be interpolated to the LM grid. 
from this Oracle database, only these data from the global model will be extracted, which cover the selected LM domain. This uh, helps to save a lot of uh, transfer time and disk space. Then the LM forecast run will be performed on any supercomputer available in the Eurogrid project using the Unicore technology. Finally, the forecast data will be returned to the user via Unicore or if the user selects, uh, the, for, the results of the LM will be visualized on the high performance computer and only the image files will be transferred back to the user via Unicore. This would uh, save a lot of uh, transfer time. A DWD, it's thought to do some verification and validation of the LM forecasts. The information and data flow uh, within MeteoGrid can be described uh, rather quickly. The user selects uh, the domain corner, the grid resolution, and the forecast date, range, and product uh, in the GUI as uh, told. The input data uh, for the domain corners and the resolution will be sent to the DWD, where the topographical input data set will be calculated. This step can only be done at DWD because the, topographical, the source topographical data set has a size of about 7 gigabyte and has to be stored permanently online. And uh, no other partner of the Eurogrid uh, is uh, recommended to do it. The, uh, date, uh, the input data about the model area and about the dates will be sent to DWD to extract the, uh, the GME data from the Oracle database. This step can in addition only be done at DWD because the GME data are only available and stored on the database at DWD. <clears throat> Both the topographical data set and the initial and lateral boundary data sets on the GME grid will be transferred to any high-performance computer in uh, Eurogrid, and uh, these data uh, serve as input for this interpolation program, GME to LM, which interpolates the GME results to the LM grid. Synchronously, the LM run itself will start. The LM results, as told, will be sent to the user or visualization of these results will be sent to the user. At the end of my presentation, I want to show you a small demonstration example about, uh, of MeteoGrid. It's a simulation of the typhoon payback in last August, uh, which stroke Japan. This kind of storm is, uh, you, it's well known that this kind of storms is usually connected with uh, strong winds, but in addition with uh, very heavy precipitation. During such a typhoon uh, passage, uh, there can be a precipitation amount of 500 to 1,000 liters per square meter within one or two days. It's equal to the annual precipitation amount uh, in maybe in Ireland or in Central Europe, but there it's within one day. Often this high precipitation causes uh, strong floodings and damages uh, which have the same amount as the damage, damages uh, uh, due to the storm. I have made uh, uh, the simulation for this uh, typhoon and uh, in these are hourly pictures and it can be seen the red lines represent uh, the isobars of sea level pressure and the shaded areas are the precipitation, the hourly precipitation before this picture. And it can be seen how the typhoon moves along the Japanese coast and uh, uh, the precipitation field is moving together with the storm uh, to the northeast. And especially uh, at the coast where onshore winds occur or at the windward slopes of the mountains, very high precipitation rates uh, will be simulated. They exceed uh, in some cases more than 40 liters uh, per square meter and per hour. 
the typhoon weakens a bit when he is uh, penetrating, when he is uh, passing uh, land traction, and it's in intensifying again when he passes uh, to the sea. At the end of my presentation, I want to show you some uh, web addresses if you are interested in more information. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think now the last presentation on this row using Unicore as a base is Mr. Erwin talking about the GRIP project. Good afternoon. My name is Dietmar Erving. I'm the manager of the GRIP project. GRIP stands for, Inter uh, for Grid Interoperability Project, and we are going to talk about interoperability between Unicore, which has been shown and talked about by Hans Christian Hoppe, and the global system, which everybody knows. Ian Foster was here and talking and say, stating that Globus is a, sort of a de facto standard. Unicore took a different approach, and I'm going to show you why and how we're going to interface with uh, Globus. I have a few of my colleagues here who did an early prototype on this system. So this is what I'm going to talk about, Unicore Globus, briefly. There's more information here in those foils. If you want to download them and look at them, uh, you have the complete information, then the GRIP objectives, a bit about architecture and the experience with an early prototype, and finally the outlook, how does it look what is the role of OXA in this world? This is the typical boilerplate, uh, EU-funded project, project number, and so on, and the website for this. Uh, the partners are um, listed here. Uh, they are essentially a subset of the um, Eurogrid project plus Argon National Laboratories, the home of Globus, which is collaborating with us. And the foils, I may, uh, may state here, have been created by uh, partners of the GRIP project. So do, I do not claim authorship for all of the foils. Briefly, Unicore and Globus. Hans Christian already said what Unicore does. Unicore, Uniform Interfaces to Computing Resources, set out to uh, provide both a modest and a ambitious solution, namely to create and seamless access to distributed resource that is secure and intuitive. And, it, and the ambition is that it can really be used in production. Tony Hay this morning said, um, many of the projects provide less than adequate quality in their, product, in their outcome that can be used in production. But this was an important objective, to have something that can be used in production, and we are at the, at the verge of using it in production, and in Yule it's, it's actually run as day-to-day -day operation for a subset of our users. Those are the partners we have them mentioned, and those are the systems that are supported initially in Germany. Uh, and the functions, I would, will not go into them, the creation of a job flow, workflow, essentially, with all the features that you would expect from such a system through a graphical interface, automating many of the functions that a user would normally have to do manually to harness a multi, uh, multitude of different resources in the grip. So this is specified by the user through the graphical interface, and all the operational handling of this is done by the Unicore system. Uh, important single sign-on security and all those features, and Hans Christian Hoppe already alluded to them. Uh, and I can state the Unicorp Plus project uh, will, end by, uh, will end at the end of this year, and all the objectives that we set out to achieve will have been achieved uh, by the end of this year, and more information can be found at this ULR. Now, Eurogrid, 
Uh, Dr. Lenz spoke about Eurogrid and especially the um, Meteorgrid aspect of the, this is another European project part using Unicore technology and those are the partners of Eurogrid um, in graphic order. And now finally Globus. Globus, as um, Ian Foster that this morning, development of Argo National Laboratories and other U.S. partners, defining protocols and API for grid computing. So it's essentially a toolbox to enable development of grid-aware applications. And this is also the basis for many international grid projects. Unicore, as I said, has a different approach. It does not want to do application development on some low-level interface. It wants to allow the user to run complex applications on the grid. If we take a simple gra a graphical view of a um, simplified grid architecture, you have the different layers, and this is adapted after uh, material shown at the Global Grid Forum, for example. You have the fabric layer, the resource layer with the APAs, APIs, protocols, higher services, and then applications and uh, portals and grid um, envi computing environments. And the lower layers is, again, in a simplified fashion, typically the role where Globus plays an important and essential role. Other projects, other grid projects like Legion, which is now Avaki, implement the full stack from the user uh, um, interface down to the protocols. And the same is also true for Unicore. So we have a verti vertically integrated project, um, uh, inter vertically integrated system if we look at it from an architectural point of view. And of course, if you take Globus, there's a certain overlap and we certainly have functions that are existing in both independently uh, developed systems. So, this naturally leads to, I to the idea that those systems which are under control of Unicore can be of benefit to all Unicore users that can access them and use those resources. What about the outside world, the ones that uh, went through the um, effort to install Globus on their systems and enable their users to develop grid applications? How could those users make use of the Unicore graphical interface which is being demonstrated outside in the booth of uh, Jülich? Uh, well, uh, this naturally built, led to the um, proposal of a project to the European Commission to develop software to facilitate the interoperation between the, those two systems. And, um, Combine the unique strengths, named the intuitive, secure um, approach, seamless approach uh, to resources with the uh, flexibility of the Globus uh, toolkit that exists. And of course, not doing this only as a purely development and research project, but demonstrating this with real life applications. So applications that could uh, run on uh, both Unicore and Globus resources, and we picked two fields, namely bio, biomolecular applications, molecular dynamics and quantum uh, chemistry codes, and meteorological applications to um, run them both in the Unicore or a Globus environment or to share those two environments. And one of the technological uh, um, challenges there is to create wrappers to support commercial applications because you don't have the code for commercial applications to put in the interfaces required to interface, for example, with Globus. Even if that might be desirable, that requires the, the vendor to do, and we are setting out to build wrappers so they can be used, can be, jobs can be submitted from Unicore and then executed in a Globus environment. And of course, uh, we set out from the beginning in the proposal of the project that uh, European ideas, European developments should influence the grid activities which are uh, today pre uh, predominantly dominated by the United States through the Global Grid Forum. Um, so the objectives, in short, again, run jobs, uh, Unicore jobs on Globus resources, run jobs using both Globus and Unicore resources together, and um, prototype standard versions of what comes along from the Global Grid Forum in this project for selected standards as they uh, evolve. 
Now let's take a brief look uh, at the key Unicore technologies, and I'm repeating some of the material shortly uh, that Hans Christian Hopper already mentioned, and look then at the differences between Unicore and, and differences and similarities between Unicore and Globus. We have a seamless computing model, job abstraction, the incarnation, that is the translation to the specific target systems done automatically by the system without the user having to know about this, file staging and transfer support, everything is done automatically without user intervention, a very strong um, security model based on X509 certificates. Uh, we accept multiple certificate policies, multiple CA policy, this is a decision of the site eventually which policy, they, which certificates they are going to accept. Technically, we are, Unicor is prepared to accept any type of uh, certificate from any CA. We have generic clients uh, um, and we have a portable, um, uh, portable implementation. Uh, the resource description in Unicor has the same model for discovery and requests, whereas Globus has uh, different models for discovery. Uh, for the request, there is the callback mechanisms. For discovery, there are directory services. In Unicore, we su support a workflow environment, that is, we support full, complex, multi-site, multi-system jobs, whereas Globus enables application development using the Globus toolkit. The Unicore security, Hans Christian Hoppe alluded to that already, is an end-to-end -end security model where everything is signed by the user and can be checked at the very end. We do not rely on transitive trust as Globus does. And I'm not judging this, I'm simply stating this is a different model and you can have different, uh, we can fulfill different objectives with either of them. Um, the incarnation, that is, the translation to what the, what the target system expects is done at the server, so it's done at a central place and the user does not have to worry, whereas in Globus uh, the client has to do the translation to the abstraction of uh, the Globus model. And the protocol uh, complexities are different, Unicor is polling, Globus is callback, but this is a technical issue. Now, let me take a brief look at the architectural aspect. Uh, Unicore, this is a different uh, look again at the Unicore architecture. You have the typical three-tier architecture, the user's workstation here, so the server that does the uh, security checking and the translation for the target system, and if a job consists of multiple, um, uses multiple sites, then pieces are sent to another gateway to execute on, diff on a different site. Uh, this is a more detailed uh, view of the Unicore architecture with the user client, uh, the server, and finally the execution systems. And uh, for the GRIP project for the interoperability project, we propose to adapt this architecture to um, um, match the Unicore environment and the Globus environment. The green, the green things are Unicore, which already exists today. If, you, uh, if everything is Unicore, then everything is green here. That exists. This is the Globus world which is not essentially, an un which is left unchanged, and the, uh, whatever color that is, the sort of uh, dirty, gr dirty yellow has to be still developed. Um, this is, we have then to develop a special Globus target system interface which does the necessary translation between Unicore's abstract job description and Globus abstract job description. We have to handle the uh, Globus proxy certificates and this will be handled in the client, and we have to do the mapping um, that uh, has to be done of the resources uh, between Unicore description and Globus description, and here we propose eventually to have a generic description and an automatic uh, generator that automatically generates the description for particular individual global sites. Also, I think in the first iteration, by the end of this year, we'll have, we will not have this automatic process. We will implement this as a selected manual process to, do, uh, to learn what, how to do it right. Um, 
I would like to um, almost complete with sh uh, sh uh, sharing with you the experience with an early prototype, which was de demonstrated in, as a part of a master thesis. This is a more detailed look of the target system interface as it exists in Unicore, which translates a Unicore abstract job in a concrete job for a target system. For this one, we developed a request interface which does uh, the Globus translation, does the translation between Unicore and RSL, and uh, handles the callbacks of the status and transmits the status back to the Unicore client along this way. In addition, since Unicore and Globus um, use of, of certificate differs, we had to implement a CA, a proxy CA in this, um, in this extended uh, target system interface to generate the proxies that Globus expects because we did not uh, want any changes to either Unicore or Globus as part of this master thesis. So he was uh, implementing this with his arms tied behind his back. Uh, that made it a little bit more difficult. And we used a fixed Globus resource as a V-site and extended the target system interface of Globus to create the proxy certificates, as I said, to map the abstract job object to RSL and to act as a Globus client effectively and then return the results to Unicore. This was proof of concept, essentially. Parts of this can be used, at least the basic parts, the concepts, and some of the code can be used in the project, but this time we're going to do it in a more professional way to, in the sense that we can now um, change uh, Unicore where needed and we have the opera cooperation with um, Argon to uh, change whatever is necessary for in the Globus world. Now let me take a brief look at the end towards the future. Uh, first of all, the project runs for two years. A first prototype um, will be delivered by the end of this year to interface Unicore with the current Globus version 2.0 system. And we decided on this because that is the production system available at f uh, for Globus. And we discussed this intensively with uh, Argon and this is a safe bet to produce the results. Uh, the project partners uh, work in the Global Grid Forum on future developments and there OGSA is certainly an important topic and we are considering to uh, look at OGSA and the prototype implementation that come from there in this project for the second year of the project if there's an opportunity to uh, exploit OGSA. As far as we can see it, and Hans Christian Hoppe already mentioned this, the architecture of OGSA and Unicore are very compatible. Uh, David Snelling, one of our key architects from uh, Fujitsu Systems Lab, demonstrated uh, in Manchester that a semi-automatic translation from the Unicore abstract job object, abstract job object to web service is possible, of course, to have the full OGSA. Once it is defined, there is more work that will be needed. Um, authorization and security will, will be a major challenge still. Uh, it's not fully defined in OGSA, and uh, Unicore expects a, logging, uh, a mapping to a Unix login, and how this is going to be handled in OGSA is yet open. Unicore technology will continue to uh, grid developments. It will be used in Germany for, by the German HPC centers, and as I said, we are using it already for a selected group of users. Um, the grid development, I'm uh, convinced, will develop from the experience gained at the Unicore tests and production sites. And Tony Hay that said this morning, they are going through phase one in the, uh, in the UK, learning what's, what's all about CAs, how to do things right. We have been through this way uh, for some time now, and we can certainly share our, ex our experience with others. And I believe that accepted standards, as they are being proposed by, for example, the Global Grid Forum and others, and proven essentials are essential for the success of grid computing. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Mr. Avin. I think now it's time to ask questions about the first three talks, if you wish to do so. so microphones available for you. Are there any questions to these three speakers so far? No, doesn't seem to be the case. Then the last not least speaker of this session will talk about the Irish work in grid computing and it's a computational physics of natural phenomena project and the speaker is Luke Dury from Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Duke, please. Oh. So I can somebody help me a bit with, with the um, file over here? Mm -hmm. Ah, there it is, yeah. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I was tempted to make a joke that this session was Germany 3, Ireland 1, but I decided it mightn't be in very good taste. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you briefly something about a project which we initiated a year ago. Uh, when it was a proposal, it had the long title of Grid-Enabled Computational Physics of Natural Phenomena, which is a wonderful title to put on a proposal, but far too cumbersome when you actually have funding. Um, we have a debate going on within the consortium as to what a good name would be, and the best working title we've come up with, and the one I think we'll finally settle on, is CosmoGrid. Uh, I said it was funded. Uh, some of you, I think, were at the first HEA national network meeting a year ago, well, not a year ago, last November, where I presented this. At that stage, we were biting our fingernails because it was being looked at by the independent assessment panel as that meeting took place. Uh, just before Christmas, we got an email to say that we had been funded and that the total was 11 million euro, but not how it was broken down, and they had put a 20% cut on it. It took nearly two months to find out where they wanted to impose cuts, and we're still actually waiting for the final go-ahead to proceed with the project, although I am assured that in the immortal phrase, the check is in the post. And I would, I think, uh, in a year's time, we will have something like 60 people in total involved with this project. Those of you who are at the opening plenary may remember that the um, PRTLI was one of the uh, funding mechanisms mentioned, which have quite recently actually begun to revolutionize scientific and particularly computer science research in Ireland. Uh, this is funded under the National Development Plan. Uh, those of you who have hired cars and are driving around will see all sorts of bypasses with signs saying that they are built as part of the National Development Plan, which is basically the government's five-year infrastructure program running to 2006. And some part, although not nearly as much as would have been the case a few years ago of that, comes from EU funds. Uh, it's a cooperative project. One of the key aims of the program for research in third level institutes is in fact to bring the various third level institutes within Ireland together and try and build critical mass in certain areas. And obviously grid computing, with its emphasis on sharing facilities and resources, is an obvious candidate for such a program, which is why we applied for it. Uh, it has to be led by a lead institute. In that case, that's ourselves, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. We do theoretical physics, cosmic physics, which is my area, and uh, Celtic studies. Uh, we looked around for well, basically among people with whom we had good contacts and who were doing work which we thought would fit naturally into such a project. And we actually came up with quite a broad field. Uh, our two major partners are the National University of Ireland in Galway and the National University of Ireland in Dublin. But we also have significant contributions from Dublin City universities. So uh, from, interestingly enough, one is allowed under this program to put a small amount of money north of the border so we were able to bring in our Mar Observatory. 
Uh, I'm interested in the extending the work of the School of Cosmic Physics to include atmospheric physics. So we were delighted when there was interest expressed by Met Aaron, which is the Irish equivalent of the Deutsche Wetterdienst. Uh, finally and crucially, we have participation from an umbrella body called Grid Ireland. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but at the time that uh, this proposal went in, essentially Grid Ireland was computer science in Galway, computer science in Trinity College Dublin, and computer science in University College Cork. And they had essentially start-up funding from another national funding program for what one could only really describe as a test bed for grid software, but not really in any sense a production grid. Uh, and finally, of course, the, one of our hosts at this conference, HEANET, as I think one of the key uh, themes running through this meeting is, if you're actually serious about building a grid, you'd better talk to your network provider and let him know exactly what your demands are and provide an interface between the network people on one hand and the grid people on the other. Uh, so, as, as we haven't actually started yet, I can't really describe what we've, I certainly can't describe what we've put in place. I can say something about what we want to put in place, and I think it might be useful as much of the detail has really been covered very well and better than I could in the earlier talks today, to concentrate more on the sort of philosophical and strategic issues. And one of the key ideas that we had was that there should, as far as possible, be essentially one grid. And in the case of Ireland, this means one organization, Grid Ireland, which, however, would support many different virtual organizations. And if you believe that the grid is, in essence, about sharing resources, it makes sense, as far as possible, to try and standardize your middleware so that if, at some point, you decide that virtual organization one could usefully interact with virtual organization two, you haven't built in artificial barriers. And as well as that, there's a, there are efficiency arguments for saying that, as far as possible, the middleware, where it is generic, should be managed independently of the specific user groups by a central, well, not a central, but by a single organization. Uh, so we have a vision that there should be one grid, but many different virtual organizations. And in the case of Ireland, the first national virtual organization is therefore going to be CosmoGrid. Being the first is in some ways a bit of a burden. Um, first of all, you've got to succeed. And you've got to be there quickly, and you've got to also make sure that you get a reasonable infrastructure and people in place quickly. So for all these reasons, we decided that the best thing to do was to begin with what in grid terms is actually a rather straightforward, vanilla, and in this context, rather boring proposal, but from our point of view, exciting, of course, and go for a relatively straightforward computational grid. Of course, grids are much more than that, but it's a good place to start because there's a lot of experience and one can be reasonably confident that one can build a pretty straightforward computational grid quickly and get it working. Once we have that, of course, we want to use that then to spawn further proposals involving data grids, knowledge grids, and all the other things that we've heard about. And we are, in fact, in the process of doing that. We have it. the other major funding channel at the moment is Science Foundation Ireland, and my colleagues building on the uh, CosmoGrid proposal, have a much more ambitious proposal going into Science Foundation Ireland at the moment. And in fact, we hope to do that on an all-island basis, and I was very pleased that Tony Hay in his talk mentioned this, as an, that there would be interest from the eScience English initiative in collaborating on this. What are our objectives? Uh, most of us in the consortium are actually physicists, not particularly computer science or network people. But then I notice an awful lot of people here are actually physicists by training. Uh, I'm actually an astrophysicist, and my interest is in high-energy phenomena, in particular particle acceleration and the origin of cosmic rays. I could talk for hours on this if you wanted to, but I'm sure you don't. But this is a computationally 
demanding phenomenon, you, if you want to model it properly, you really have to do quite detailed computational modeling, and that takes a lot of power. I have colleagues who are extremely interested in star formation. We saw some nice pictures earlier this morning of jets from young stars. That is one area where we've been very active. Again, you can throw almost unlimited amounts of computing power at this problem if you want to simulate it properly. We have a section involved in geophysics. Uh, they are very interested, obviously, in seismic inversions. Uh, there is a bit of a revolution at the moment in seismic studies because you have now got broadband seismic recorders, the possibility of digital recording techniques, uh, much broader frequency coverage, much more information, and in, in principle, much better models if you have the computing power to invert the data. Again, it needs a lot of computing power. If you've done your seismic studies and you've got models for what is under the Earth, 10, 20 kilometers down, you'd like to understand how it was formed. So you would like to do what is called rheological modeling, where you take models of, for example, the extension of the Earth's crust, which formed the Atlantic Ocean, and try and work out how the rocks stretched and bent and deformed. Uh, to do that, it turns out you need detailed understanding of how rocks actually behave under extreme conditions of pressure. And we have a very interesting proposal coming from my colleague Chris Bean in UCD uh, to actually build essentially a digital model of a large rock. You might think rocks are simple, and at one level they are. I mean, they're just made of mineral grains. The complication comes about because all real rocks contain cracks and fissures and voids and defects. And in many cases, the, it turns out that the mechanical properties depend crucially on the scale distribution of these defects. And therefore, it is not a simple problem to extrapolate properties of rocks measured on small samples in the laboratory to kilometer-sized blocks which you might have in your models. And one way of doing it is to build a, a detailed digital rock where you can study it in the computer, so to speak. Finally, I mentioned that we wanted to expand a bit into atmospheric physics, and there is obviously considerable interest and importance in developing regional climate models. There are large-scale global and European-level climate models, but nobody at the moment is really working on local regional climate models of this island. And we have colleagues in Galway who are interested in atmospheric aerosol modeling, which feeds into this area. All of these problems have a certain similarity. Um, they are in essentially problems in classical physics. They're all causal. They're all local in a certain sense. And this actually means that they are very well suited to rather simple Beowulf-type clusters for the computations. Um, if you do quantum systems, quantum lattice gale feature theory, for example, you have the problem that everything interacts with everything. Uh, but if you're doing class this type of classical simple system, essentially one which can be modeled with hyperbolic equations and where you can, with a bit of luck, get away with explicit solvers, uh, then these work extremely well on Beowulf clusters. There is significant overlap between the methods used in these areas, even though these different communities mightn't normally talk to each other very much, uh, even at the level sometimes of the underlying mathematics. And, of course, these are areas where you have reasonably large and computationally sophisticated user communities. So we felt this was a good place to try and exploit resource sharing and get a grid going. So what, what are we going to do? Well, uh, the straw proposal this, uh, was to construct three medium-scale to large Beowulf clusters, typically about... High, the, uh, the actual proposal said 128. We could probably go to up about 200 processors uh, interconnected over Grid Ireland. Uh, as I said, we want to have, a, as far as possible, to separate the grid level from the user level. And therefore, we want to have dedicated grid gateway machines, rather as we saw actually in the Unicore proposal, uh, in each site. And these will be centrally monitored and 
up, the software updated by Grid Ireland. And uh, because it is a distributed collaboration, we do need, as far as possible, uh, to uh, provide means for collaboration, and we are proposing to use VRVS because that seems to be the most scalable and affordable method of providing large-scale video conferencing for collaboration of this type, although we are, of course, looking at Access Grid, and we might consider implementing Access Grid at least on the larger nodes. Um, what problems do we anticipate? Not too many, really, uh, but I throw them up just, for, just to see if you have any views on them. I think, I forget who it was, but somebody today made the remark that the problems would be actually with the users and the humans and not with the machines and the networks. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, one problem I do see coming is how exactly do you get a virtual organization to develop a sense of community? It's all very well to say you can communicate over VRVS, but it's not quite the same as meeting every morning over a cup of coffee. Um, not a, at the moment a major problem, but if we expanded, we, there is a slight question as to what sort of legal structure you should give a virtual organization. We certainly don't want to overburden it, but on the other hand, if you're responsible for many millions of euros, you can't do that without some sort of legal structure. And when we get to the stage where we have multiple overlapping and dynamically evolving VOs using the same set of resources, uh, there is certainly potential for conflicts of interest, and it will be interesting to see how we develop conflict resolution mechanisms. I mentioned that this is only, we see this very much as a first step. Uh, we explicitly recognize that you know, in this proposal, we went for a computational grid, but we need to balance that with a data grid, and that, in fact, is one key strand in the SFI proposal that has just gone in. Long term, uh, we would be interested in exploring the possibilities, which are sometimes called knowledge grids, by adding semantic content and more intelligence to the grid. Uh, one way I, th I like to put this is that the problem isn't actually data analysis anymore, it's data synthesis. It's how do you actually bring together data from coming from different sources and put it together into a coherent whole. And finally, um, I think if we're looking to the future, we should actually be thinking in terms not necessarily just of e-science, but more generally of e-scholarship. I mean, this is a very general technology which will revolutionize the way we do research, not just in the natural sciences, not just in mathematics, but throughout the humanities as well. And, of course, uh, the whole idea of this proposal is that it should form part of a larger European structure. We, are very, we have also sent in an expression of interest for Framework 6, and the whole the whole idea of grids is that they should eventually be Europeanized, regionalized, and eventually globalized. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Well, if not, I would like to thank the speakers once again for their talks. <laughs> Close the session and Please remember that there is a Bird of a Feather session on grid aware networks at 6 o'clock tonight. There will be buses leaving at 18.30, as you know, for the uh, dinner. And there will be late buses for those who may wish to attend the Bird of a Feather session. Thank you very much. <laughs>